Uh, so yes, hello everybody. So my name is Matthias. Uh, I uh, do, um, well, I guess uh, theoretical computer science research, which uh, sort of somebody I know describes as we think about what we can do with machines we don't have. Uh, now, uh, I do find that it is especially among like uh, cryptography or security people that uh, that seems like a less ridiculous thing to think about than, than it normally would, simply because cryptography and security are all about, you know, putting adversaries in a situation uh, and understanding that they cannot do something in it. There are other reasons why we like cryptography, which is that um, th th there's something very, very interesting about sort of this ability to create a private key and then there being these things that only you can do. Um, a lot of these sort of theories like to make these very, very absolutist statements about what you can do or, or can do or can compute and can compute. And then, um, you know, all, all of this sort of uh, 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 cryptography kind of creates kind of an interesting tension. Nonetheless, I'm not going to be talking sort of about any of that. Uh, I'm going to be uh, just sort of talking about um, um, creativity and computation and sort of how some of these more theoretical ideas might, I guess, help with sort of understanding um, Creativity better. Now, creativity is one of those words that sort of means a lot of things to a lot of different people. Um, you know, some people like find it like this very, very significant thing. Other people think this is just something sort of artists made up. Uh, and so uh, uh, for, for that reason, I, I would perhaps just sort of like, like perhaps just, I guess, contextualize it just a little bit. So if you look at like most of the um, consumer apps that people have on their phone today, um, a lot of, I guess, software engineers will sort of complain that they are these uh, uh, CRUD or crude apps. They, you know, you sort of, uh, um, uh, you create, you read, you update, and you delete or something like that. And uh, the reason so many of these apps that people have today are, you know, have this incredibly similar form is that fundamentally they're all about connecting you with information that other people have produced. Uh, be the, be, you know, be that information tweets or pictures or, or you know, whatever really. However, you know, when computers kind of started out um, and, you know, to, to a very significant extent sort of still industrially and otherwise, you know, video games and so on, um, it was all about like computers giving you information that you do not have yet, right? So, um, you know, it will tell you, you know, how to shoot a rocket, um, how to build a building, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but despite that, there still are like many, many types of information that sort of computers do not produce, such as, um, um, you know, scientific theories, literary works, and especially given, given kind of the recent rise of generative models, I think that uh, sort, of, sort of this, the sorts of um, um, questions are sort, of, are sort of kind of interesting to think about. So what would it take to have a computer that could like really sort of produce um, all of these things? Um, and, uh, uh, so, sorry for, for, for this little glitch. And, uh, yeah, so, so the people who produce these things often make, you know, sort of, um, similar sounding statements about what it takes. We, we sort of heard earlier today that, like, the human civilization seems to be this amazing kind of problem-solving entity. Um, but nonetheless, you know, exactly what kind of allows for that isn't, isn't, isn't quite as clear as I think we would ideally want it to be, um, especially since like a lot of these things that people think are very important to it are very controversial. So, um, you know, people um, um, will talk about the importance of freedom. People will say that there is something inherently kind of open-ended about progress. And just on a practical level, for a lot of these sorts of problems that seem to require creative solutions, you cannot just make a decision that, you know, this, you know, today, a year from now, we're going we're gonna to have a solution to this problem. And, you know, here is A, B, C, and D that we will do to sort of get there. There is this kind of a um, sort of a in inherent, inherent um, uncertainty in this, in this sort of whole process. Um, so that, that just sort of, sort of as, as, as a bit of a background um, on, on, I guess, the, the question of creativity. On the question of sort of theoretical computer science, I don't know sort of how uh, uh, familiar people are with these ideas, but um, just to give sort of like a little, a little brief uh, uh, interlude. So um, some of these ideas kind of are, are kind of named sort of uh, either sort of computability theory or computational complexity theory. Uh, perhaps in the, con you know, computability theory kind of started with Alan Turing. Uh, the British recently printed him on, his ban on their banknotes, so I guess that means he was cool. So, so one of the perhaps most famous results that he came up with, so he was interested in, in this whole question of like which functions are computable. That is usually how this question of computation is, uh, is sort of conceptualized. And he sort of showed that, that sort of one of these questions, namely, um, for example, can you have a computer program that just takes 
some other computer program as input and decides whether it sort of terminates at some point or kind of runs forever. You sort of figure out that that program you know, can't exist. There are many ways of kind of looking at the argument that he presented. The way I like to look at it is that fundamentally the argument kind of restates the conventional argument with why sort of prophecy is, is hard. Like if you go to this uh, oracle in Delhi and she tells you, you know, you're going to, you know, you know, fight wars and eat a lot of pizza, then, you know, why, why you know, why, why don't you just kind of eat cookies? You, you know, you could just decide, okay, well, thanks, and then just kind of eat cookies instead. And uh, th there is a sort of a similar reason why why that sort of a th why that kind of a program isn't possible. Um, a related field is sort of something called computational complexity theory. Basically, people who, who were kind of thinking about these computable, computable functions realized that some of them just require a ridiculous amount of resources to, to compute. So they ended up, ended up thinking, OK, what, what if we think about sort of just things we can compute where the resources don't scale too badly? Perhaps one of the most interesting ideas there is this whole concept of NP complete problems that is actually sort of interesting to people because um, there, there, there are all of these like little deceptively simple seeming problems where you can sort of plausibly argue that there simply is no fast solution for them because if there was, um, you could kind of do all kinds of things. And th there is also some sort of a relationship um, with creativity there. But kind of on that background, um, what sorts of interesting things might be, might be sort, of, sort of kind of said about creativity? So one interesting result, for example, that is somewhat inspired by um, sort of philosophy of science is, uh, now I don't know if you, any, any of you know people who think about philosophy of science, but these tend to be very opinionated people. Uh, nonetheless, uh, a lot of these you know, things they have very, very strong opinions on uh, agree. So, so for example, a lot of them kind of agree that the way science works is not by kind of you know, sort of patiently building or accumulating sort of observation or sort of building like a building on solid foundations, you know, whether you call them paradigms that are changing, whether you call them conjectures and refutations, updating, there is the sense that, uh, that, there, is, that there is kind of an ebb and flow to, to how people think that people sort of change their minds over time. There are things that people kind of thought were true that are no longer to be true. And what one thing you can do is you can, is you can look at sort of similar computations, like both of these kind of uh, theories that I described before sort of think of computations in terms of having like sort of a start and a finish, but you could instead just be thinking about processes where you sort of have these programs that kind of just, you know, create this kind of ever larger corpus of knowledge and they can sort of change their mind whatever they want. Um, the, you know, you sort of know that at some point they, they stop changing their mind, but you, you know, they don't know when that happens. The point is, um, if you look at like what sorts of functions can you kind of come to fallibly know in this way, it is sort of a much larger class of functions than simply the computable ones, which I guess gives you some sort of an indication of um, that, you know, th th there is in fact perhaps something very, very different about creativity and this sort of open-endedness and so on. And finally, you know, in terms of like, like the potential of what might be there, if you look at a lot of these generative models, there is this interesting of question of like, sort of like what is the, their potential? Like, okay, you know, they, they can generate certain kinds of text or generate certain kinds of images, but how car could you kind of push them if you gave them sort of ever more data? And uh, there is a certain sense that, for example, that I believe that if, if you have this like incredibly capable um, generative model, in the long run, it should become very, very unpredictable because kind of, you know, everything that it does in the future kind of depends on things it creates in the future versus a lot of sort of like programs and algorithms people think about at present, you know, have, have this incredible kind of predictability to it and sort of figuring out where exactly the boundaries uh, between these things are is, uh, is, sort of, is sort of an interesting thing to think about. So I wanted to give that as a quick taste. I don't know how long this was, uh, but... Uh... I was going to ask, uh, if, to the, like, can you speak to the members of the audience who have some like, fundamentals of like, what an NP complete problem is, or like key space, how you formalize some of this, these aspects of creativity? Yeah. Uh, so, for example, so the way, um, so, so this result that I mentioned, uh, the first one, you can kind of think of it, so think of it like a Turing machine that doesn't have um, like, like sort of uh, like, uh, like a halting stain, basically, right? So you just have like a tape, like with zeros and ones, and like, like the machine is just going to go and it's going to change this, these sorts of zeros and ones. Um, and you can sort of think of the function that it is kind of trying to learn as the particular zeros and ones that it has. So like, like you know, normally, we, like instead of having like an input one and what it does on input one, there is like, oh, like what it does on like one is just the first bit, what it does on two is the second bit and so on. Now let's say that you have a machine and you know that eventually it sort of stops changing its mind for every bit. You don't know when it happens, it doesn't know what it happens. And then you can ask which functions can you kind of get on this tape, right? 
And uh, it turns out that, for example, you can get the halting problem function very, very easily like, like on that way. But you can, in fact, get more than that. So I, I hope that answered the question. Okay, thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. All right, thank you.